everyone. Uh, we're uh, excited to kind of have a conversation around diagnostic reports and really a lot of the in intricacies about how it uh, interacts with the medical necessity process. And, you know, as part of the Autism Legal Resource Center and the foundations courses, and, you know, we are getting more and more information and, and seeing the challenges that can uh, surface around diagnostic reports. So we were able to track down a expert in this space. So we have uh, Kim Hills with us. And so she can kind of highlight and talk through some of the uh, that part in regards to um, diagnostic aspects. And uh, but, you know, maybe before we get started, if we could just introduce ourselves real quickly and then we'll jump into some additional information about the, the spirit of the podcast. Um, I'm Tim Courtney. I uh, am transitioning from a position where I was COO for a nonprofit that does therapy with kids with autism, specializing in ABA therapy, uh, and have spent a lot of my career focused more on logistics and operations and me the medical necessity process and treatment planning. And uh, I'm transitioning now into uh, leadership of a, of a billing company that's uh, clear path billing that will be specializing in revenue cycle management services for other ABA providers. Uh, Kim, do you want to go th real quickly through your? Absolutely. I'm, yep. I'm Kimberly Hills. I am a clinical professor and licensed psychologist at the University of South Carolina in the Department of Psychology. I'm also an independent trainer on the ADOS and I've been doing diagnostic evaluations for about 15 years now and spend majority of my career in the past 10 years focused on diagnostics related to autism and related disorders. Um, I'm excited to be here today. I, th I hope we can kind of talk through some of these different issues that are the kind of the spirit of this podcast and we'll kind of move forward. Yeah. Dan, what about you? And I'm Dan Unum. I'm uh, president of the Autism Legal Resource Center. I'm a lawyer um, and a parent of a 19-year-old with autism, which is how I um, got involved in this whole area. Um, way back in 2007, my wife and I got legislation passed in South Carolina mandating that uh, ABA uh, be covered uh, as a treatment for autism and began working on that issue across the country with parents and providers. Um, at various times, we were both at Autism Speaks. Uh, my wife, Lori, as Vice President of State Government Affairs, and I as Executive Director of uh, an Autism Legal Resource Center that I founded there. I now continue that work uh, through my own firm, the Autism Legal Resource Center, and I work with providers and provider associations and parents across the country uh, to ensure that they have access uh, to uh, treatment, and particularly that they have access to applied behavior analysis and access uh, consistent with their medical needs um, and their um, and, and, and what they need um, to, uh, to survive and thrive and, and, and do as well as they possibly can. And so that's kind of my concern is to make sure that people do have access, that providers can practice in accordance with their training and experience and, and uh, that uh, um, families and children and, and adults for that matter have access to quality applied behavior analysis services without any kind of artificial restrictions. And so that's why this conversation today is extremely important for me because I think one of the um, impediments to getting that kind of access has been a lack of coordination uh, between diagnosticians and between ABA practitioners uh, and um, the importance of the diagnostic report now that ABA is really Know, firmly within the healthcare system uh, to a great degree is extremely important. And I don't think uh, the implications have been fully thought, thought through because uh, the diagnostic report remains a touchstone for how treatment is carried out. Uh, and uh, we're gonna flesh that out a little bit today, but I think if we can get on a better coordination of that, it's gonna improve access to treatment uh, for folks all around. Autism Legal Resource Center, in addition to providing legal and consulting services um, uh, to uh, provider associations, providers, and families and other stakeholders around the country, uh, also we've gotten involved with doing uh, intensive training sessions. And I was fortunate enough to um, 
I have a partner in Tim Courtney, who's got extensive background in the area, both of, not only of behavior analysis, but also in the practicalities of insurance and insurance reimbursement and operations. Uh, Tim um, has been the chief operating officer of uh, Little Star Center, which was, uh, is based in Indiana, which was the uh, state with the very first autism insurance mandate. And so he's had a long background in that. And Tim and I would often run into each other at conferences and we'd start engaging in conversations. I would come at it from my legal perspective of here's how I kind of been looking at the issues and Tim would come at it from a clinical and an operations perspective. And we began to realize, hey, we're really actually talking about the same thing. The way I'm looking at the issues is the same way Tim is just from our different backgrounds that we have to really analyze, you know, what is the way to show that things are medically necessary, that medical necessity is kind of the touchstone once you are in the healthcare system, uh, that various laws come into play that protect the ability of providers to deliver services. And that kind of requires, again, a knowledge about healthcare and the way healthcare works and billing. Um, and we were particularly interested in the diagnostic report because once you are in the healthcare system, once you know you have to have a diagnosis to access treatment, obviously that diagnostic report has a lot of importance. And we both kind of latched on to the fact of, look, if what we were talking about in terms of objectives that we're targeting, et cetera, are, are grounded in the child's autism, are grounded in the child's autism spectrum disorder, um, then that certainly has to be medically necessary, right? I mean, that's just kind of the definition of it. And part of that uh, analysis is to look back at the diagnostic report and kind of see, well, what were they identifying? How did they come to the, that diagnosis? So we then began focusing on the diagnostic report. And then in those conversations, um, you know, it became apparent and quite frustrating that we saw diagnostic reports being used by funders in ways that we were pretty sure the diagnosticians never intended. Um, and uh, because of that, we thought, man, I wish we could kind of, we'd love to talk to the person who did the diagnosis. Did you realize that, you know, this statement that you have in your diagnostic report is being used to actually limit or deny care to this child based on this kind of a theory? Uh, and so Tim was just, you know, and, and Tim had been starting to have these conversations kind of within, you know, his kind of local community. And I'll let you know, Tim kind of speak to that, but that's what started us down the process. Yeah, and we also reference it in the foundations courses we were doing, and it would always generate a lot of conversation. It was really, you know, always interesting. It was really interesting in workshops presenting to psychologists and seeing, you know, similar like, you know, what, what Dr. Hills was referencing, like just kind of like, wow, real surprise that the kinds of things are being interpreted in ways in which the diagnostic report was being used to support adverse determinations around medical necessity and you know so it it definitely became really evident to us that like yeah let's let's talk to an expert around this like let's try to figure out you know what what are ways in which we could you know understand the role of the diagnostic report and you know is it how it's being interpreted what, how bcbas are being asked to be included you know which really kind of led us to to trek down and um Pin, pin Dr. Hills down to a conversation here. That's right. And so just as a practical matter, uh, so to mention the foundations course, that's one of the intensive uh, training programs that we do uh, for primarily for behavior analysts, but for other professionals as well to kind of explain to them what the laws are uh, regarding um, coverage of applied behavior analysis, what the clinical considerations are, what the legal ramifications are, and really how to integrate those uh, so that you have a broad, comprehensive working knowledge of the system, if you will, uh, to make sure that you can um, you know, present the best case to get access to care. And so our program manager, um, Shannon O'Connor, who um, uh, is a uh, psychology background by training, said, well, you need to talk with uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Kimberly Hills, whom um, you know, she worked uh, closely with. Um, she is involved in these areas and is very um, interested in making sure that folks have access to treatment. Um, they have a very uh, unique uh, clinic uh, here in South Carolina uh, that uh, makes sure that kids have access to treatment. We need to talk with her. And so we did. She facilitated that conversation. 
and then we went from there. So at some point, uh, I don't know how you reacted to that, you know, originally, uh, Kim, but, um, you know, from your perspective, here are these uh, guys all of a sudden badgering you about your reports. Uh, and I appreciate that in, uh, in good spirits, you, uh, you really took that seriously. And, and, you know, we're not at all put off by that as, as you know, can sometimes happens where, you know, one professional kind of challenges another professional in some way. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And so I was, you know, honestly, my feeling related to being contacted is relief. Like, I'm sure Shannon knows me well. And like, I'm sure she's like, she needs to know this. She wants to know this. And I absolutely am relieved to be like included and involved in this conversation because it is, I do believe it's not a, a diagnostician's intention to write a report in a way that's going to limit or deny care. And just that awareness is just so important. And I know we're gonna to continue to develop that awareness, but I'm definitely excited to continue these conversations and grateful to be involved. Yeah, and thanks as well. Like you did a really nice job in drafting up like that sample diagnostic report that we actually use in the foundations course. So we can kind of have people exploring and looking at, you know, a good example of a, of a, of a diagnostic report. So that was you know, really great as well. So I, I agree with Dan, I think it's, it's really refreshing to see this like just wide open to like how can we work together better with the ultimate outcome of you know this real shared interest and in, like we just want to help kids with autism and individuals with autism you know have you know a real significant change in their um in their life and how how the uh, diagnosis is impairing them mm -hmm. and to that point i think it'd be you know great and you know kim you mentioned like the spirit of this conversation and, and really trying to, and I think you summarize as well, we've had the, you know, Dan and I had the chance to, to talk with Kim previously, and you know, I think you really summarized it well when you were talking about, you know, seeing that the diagnostic report is really a gateway, kind of a way to access treatment. And, you know, psychologists are, you know, typically kind of envisioning that this is gonna open up access uh, to treatment. But, you know, around that, I mean, is there like, if you could think about a typical kind of uh, scenario that's often encountered by a psychologist. So they have a, you know, someone shows up and they're like, you know, I think my child has autism, you know, just going from there, like what is a really a pretty typical kind of process that gets to a diagnostic report? Absolutely. And so many um, diagnostic evaluations are done in the context of a standalone clinic. Not all, of course, but many are. And how those standalone clinics typically work is they provide diagnostic evaluation services and they may provide other services, but typically they're providing the diagnostic evaluation and then that the parents and family take at that and, and move forward with treatment elsewhere. Um, and so it's helpful just to know like for us as diagnosticians, they're coming to our clinic or our center, wherever we're located, maybe it be a hospital, they're going through our evaluation process. Some evaluation processes are designed to be done in one day. Some are done over a couple appointments, um, but we give feedback in the sp and provide a report where we document the diagnosis. We, and then we send that report to the parents. If, we, if the parents want us to send it elsewhere, we can, but it's typically the parent driving that process. And then we send the parents on their way and they go to access treatment elsewhere. And, I don't want to speak for all psychologists, of course, or all diagnosticians, but oftentimes our understanding is they need the medical diagnosis to access treatment and kind of open the door to treatment and then they go from there. And for us, you know, we want to make sure that it's making that they're accessing treatment. And so if there's barriers to that, I think that's, you know, kind of what's led to this is if there's barriers to that. It's really important for the psychologists to know, because we're not necessarily giving feed, getting feedback from outside sources regarding that. It kind of, it's case closed at, at the feedback session. Okay. And do you know, would you have a sense of what percentage, because I know a lot of times these are happening maybe in university settings um, where it might not involve billing insurance, but you know, is it more common, you would say, that it is going to be resulting where there would be some process to get approved and then you would bill insurance and, and, and then, you know, they're kind of going through some aspect to authorize doing the evaluation and then you, the psychologist would get reimbursed for it? Yes, most, I would say probably most are doing that in terms of 
um, filing for insurance reimbursement. The, the clinic that or the center that I work at is a little bit different for a sliding scale private pay, but I think that's more atypical. Okay. The, and you mentioned like, uh, so after that, it's kind of common that that's kind of the end of that relationship, right? So you have done yes. the diagnostic report, you know, you kind of have helped the family to understand and there, is it, you know, fairly common, like the, the closing part of, you know, and looking at a lot of, um, reports they'll have uh, like a like recommendations for additional services and therapy and so there'll maybe some conversation about that but then you know families will often kind of go on and and will start their journey towards intervention correct yep and so most of the time you're going to see a, like a list of recommendations the specificity of those recommendations like how specific we are in those might vary um, but typically we're giving some general recommendations to move them forward, right? So here's, you have the report, you have your diagnosis, if that's the case, and here's where to go next. It's kind of like, here's the next step and then case closed. And that's the end of that relationship typically, unless you're working in a center that also provides a direct link to treatment. And so there may be a closer link there, but more often than not, it seems that it's in standalone diagnostic clinics. And, you know, related to that, so once you're gone, so the family's gone, I mean, would it be appropriate or are there are situations where a family, if they are encountering some resistance or challenge from an insurance company, you know, there's some, they would go, they could go back to the psychologist and say, hey, we're having these issues. Um, and, you know, these are the things that are coming up. It, would that be, you know, an appropriate thing for a, a family to do? It's a good question. I mean, I think it's just be a, be a matter of a psychologist's willingness and availability. I do think in cl clinics where there's pressure to, you know, like the, in terms of billable hours, mm -hmm. that they may not be as available. I don't, I mean, in the last 15 years of doing these evaluations, I'm trying to think if there's ever been a situation, you know, where somebody has called me back and it really hasn't been in the context of autism. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's um, if I can interject, uh, Tim, just because this is such a, an important point for us, um, I think that because the, the touchstone now for treatment, of course, once, once the uh, diagnostician is done, it goes to the, let's say ABA is recommended, it goes to the behavior analyst, medical necessity will be the question. And the mere fact that the child has been diagnosed with autism is not kind of the end of that inquiry, but almost really the beginning of that inquiry. Because then the question becomes, all right, the child has autism, you've recommended ABA, but what is the ABA going to look like? What, what targets have to be addressed? What objectives have to be addressed? What are the child's you know, deficiencies as identified in the diagnostic report? And that's where the insurers and the funders are going to look back to that as kind of a check on, is this in fact um, you know, a symptom of this child's ASD that needs to be addressed? So the report is important, not only uh, for the diagnosis, but really the details of the diagnosis. So what we're hoping to do is kind of flesh out a little bit uh, today, what some of those issues are so that um, kids and parents don't have to try and come back to the diagnostician. The mm -hmm. detail that's needed and the clarifications that are important are included in the report in the first instance. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And I think that just the point that you make is so key for psychologists to hear is that it's the beginning of that inquiry at the you know, time of the report and the diagnosis and how the insurance companies are using that information for treatment planning or treatment decisions, which at least for me, it was not, it's just an interesting thing to do that because our diagnostic reports are going to speak to the symptoms of a disorder and provide evidence for such, but they may not be getting as specific as needed to be able to achieve that mission. So they're using a diagnostic report for purposes that it's not necessarily intended for. And I think that's what was shocking to me to hear and to be aware of that we're giving more summary based information, right? So we're speaking to these symptoms, but it's a summary of, of that symptom and how it presents for this child, not the specifics in terms of where you could just lift information, maybe some pieces, but not all off of, our, off of the reports to, to do exact treatment planning. And I think that's just something that is really important for us as psychologists, diagnosticians to hear. 
And I think that also, and Tim's going to speak to this in a second, but um, not only the detail needed or just the clarity needed, but also things in the diagnostic report that really are not meant to be carry a lot of weight, but they're just kind of put in there to have a general background and flat uh, for the parents' benefit, um, and yet are used often in ways that were not intended at all and kind of really in, in ultimately improperly, um, having to do with things like the, you know, the child's um, social um, situation and strengths and things like that. Um, Tim, if, if, I think it might be useful if you can kind of bullet from your perspective some of the ways you see diagnostic reports used and used in ways probably that, as Kim just said, are, are not something that the diagnostician really intended to be used. Yeah. To be appreciated yeah, yeah. to be used that way. Yeah. And I think that, um, and that was, you know, just, I've learned a lot from the conversation we've been able to have with him around these things. And I, um, but I, I, I do think it would be really interesting to talk through a couple of scenarios and situations that we see that you know are coming up where there are interpretations uh, around medical necessity um, and that, that are tied into the diagnostic report. The diagnostic report is being used as a source of support for a, an adverse determination. You know, ones that I know of uh, in particular where you'll see uh, a reference to strengths in the report and those strengths, so we'll, you know, just like you were identifying, we, you'll identify the symptoms uh, and impairments and, uh, and those will be used to, to, as maybe supportive for uh, various uh, objectives that are, are being addressed or, but the, on the other side is where strengths will be used uh, as because they are, you know, the patient is exhibiting some some area of strength that's used to say okay you shouldn't have to target that you know so you know what are your your, your thoughts uh, in particular just on that issue so if there was a strength that would be identified and you know and you've talked about this before and I'm hoping we could capture a little bit here about you know just the use of strengths in general like what what would you say is you know commonly why that's included in a diagnostic report so typically when we are approaching a diagnostic evaluation we're wanting to pr provide like a whole child, you know, a clinical overview. And once you know one child with autism, you know one child with autism, right? The classic state, one of the classic statements. And so it's important to us as diagnostic diagnosticians, even though it might have ramifications, so that's why it's so important to know, is we describe strengths and weaknesses because there may be social communication behaviors that are present that maybe we don't typically see, right? Or that we want to point out that this child has a, I think one of the examples that's come up is like has a friend and where an insurance company might use that. It's like, oh, social is fine. Social interactions are fine. Where that's not what we were saying at all. We are just like almost like baseline levels. Like, well, they have one friend. And even usually if you read further, like I can remember cases I've had where they have one friend, but that child also has autism, but they're using things that we're presenting as strengths or as present that are going to help them, you know, in terms of adaptive behavior against us or against, you know, service provision, which I found shocking. And so to uh, me, I don't know if we can get around like the pro like profiling strengths and weaknesses. Like I think it's important to what skills are present, what skills are absent, but it's important to me to know then how to present those skills that are present in a way that still speaks to just because this child has one friend and I'm just using this as an example, doesn't mean that we can just write that area off. It's like, they're fine. You know, they're typically yeah. functioning in that domain. It's an excellent point too, because you know, the child may have a friend, but if you kind of drill down on that, that friendship isn't like anything that we would recognize as a true social interactive friendship. It's more a case where the, you're really just identifying there's a potential building block out there there is a child with or there's some level of relationship. And that may be something really good for the uh, behavior analyst to start building and working with because there's at least something there, but doesn't by any means mean to say, you know, check that box, you know, has social interaction. So excellent point. I'm, um, I really, I'm, I'm quite confident that uh, folks don't appreciate 
how much weight is given to those kind of statements and the way they're given. So we just, you know, really wanted to start this conversation. We don't have the ultimate answer. Uh, I think we need to have more conversation after this about how we address those, but that, that's an important issue. Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts on if it was, you know, a, and, and part of delivering, there would be, you know, knowledge of these are pieces that we could, you know, know that would be more in the, in the delivery and the conversation around it when the report's being delivered. And then, you know, and, and then so there are some of that where it doesn't seem overly negative that's, you know, in the actual document or report, but the report is more a summary of what are the symptoms and impairments that led to justifying the diagnosis. Absolutely. I do think we could, that might be a way to address this where it's so just to kind of clarify, like when we're giving the feedback is maybe we don't write in the report, these, you know, specific items that we might be talking about with the parents, but we just do it verbally with the parent. I do think that might be an option. To me, another option might be, is, is there, because I'm still very concerned about this summary notion where we provide summaries and with details, kind of like detail, detail here and there just to kind of give examples. And if we take out the examples that are strengths related, okay, but we still have a summary. I still am concerned about the insurance company lifting summary information to try to determine treatment um, targets. And so I'm also wondering, is there a way that we can word or use language in our reports to speak to strengths, but speak to it in a way that doesn't work against the child in terms of tr treatment provision in providing medically necessary services. I think yeah. that's really important. Um, Tim, did you have further on that? I was, well, it's, it's interesting. I'm just trying to run through and think through like we typically will do in the foundations course, trying to think about like the medical surgical side of this. Like, is it common where you would refer out to like a specialist to diagnose something right and so they would then go through and it's often going to be the case where it's all about like you know this is broken whatever and here's all the things that are wrong with it and that's all that's being kind of highlighted by the specialist and and then the intervention you know is where maybe more of that like okay here are things that are going well here's where we're, here's what we'll need to do uh and then they develop a treatment plan and kind of will go from there um but it's you, it's when we start dealing with you know, behavior and psychology, I think it, it gets to be, you know, sometimes hard to have that parallel because there's so much emotion. There's so, you know, so many aspects where it gets to be comprehensive, but that's where I was trying to envision like what that could look like if it was a little, you know, if we kind of try to parallel more. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, I, th I think too, as long as we're aware that these specific details just to be careful about how we are including them in the report and be mindful of who's getting it and, and that insurance companies and maybe they're different depending on the insurance are going to use it maybe differently to determine treatment services. Yeah. And your reference to like um, the specificity around symptoms and, you know, impairment areas that are identified like that was real helpful for me as well, because I'm actually one that likes to, on the treatment side, like I'm really encouraging, like, let's try to pull from that, like, as far as like, it should inform what we're doing for further assessment, right? So we're pulling that for sure. It's like, you guys are the experts in autism. Here are things that you found that are, you know, that have led to the, the confirming a diagnosis. Now we're going to use that to remediate, right? Because now those are areas that are core to what we need to target and address. But on the flip side, when you think about strengths, strengths are noted, but there's no necessary assessment to say, hey, that's at mastery, like this is sufficient. And so now you shouldn't target anything in that domain, right? So th that's where it does seem like, wow, there is a huge extrapolation that would happen to pull that strength area out and say, hey, don't target this, you know, which is it's it's happening occasionally in interpretations by, uh, you know, a payer where we'll see kind of some reference or insurance company will reference, you know, that in the medical necessity determination. Mm -hmm. Tim, I think another, uh, just a couple of quick uh, areas that we also want to make sure we touch on um, in, in the time we have are um, uh, 
funders who specify and kind of dictate what types of tests and assessments should be used for diagnosis. I'm gonna actually rattle these off and then let's just kind of take them one at a time. Uh, timing of the diagnosis. And we have um, uh, some insurers saying that with as little as six months, if I don't have a, a diagnosis that's been done within six months of the onset of treatment, then the child can't proceed with treatment, which is obviously devastating with autism because any delay in treatment has, um, has long-term consequences. And then also uh, an issue that we are seeing more and more is with comorbidity and where there's another diagnosis of a potential um, issue that the child has and that is being used essentially to say, well, this is all attributable to that diagnosis and therefore, um, you know, ABA is not appropriate. And so how important it is for the diagnostician to at least make an initial assessment. Yes, the child has symptoms that would fall within the, you know, diagnostic criteria for X condition that does not in any way impact the child's need for ABA. Um, I'm seeing some real interesting stuff. There's some interesting studies out of Japan talking about, and I think this may even be older uh, people with um, autism, but with other mental health conditions and really cautioning, um, you know, sometimes people will look and say, well, this is really a mental health condition needs to be treated with traditional mental health techniques. And what they're finding is particularly with people with autism, if you do not take into account uh, the, 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 what happens with autism, the, the, uh, you know, the symptoms and the function and how that interrelates, and, and don't essentially treat the autism, which frequently is gonna require ABA, it undermines the efficacy of any kind of mental health treatment. They simply are not going to respond to the same types of mental health treatment that would apply to folks that don't have autism. So kind of all three of those, if we can touch briefly on those, that would be really uh, helpful. Uh, you know, the specification of the tests, the comorbidity and the recency of diagnosis. If I could just restate just to, because to me, this is just, I need, like, I'm like, we need to know this is so what you're saying is insurance companies will deny treatment if we, if our diagnostic evaluations do not have the appropriate tests, right? If we don't cover specific areas that they mandate, if it's related to some issue, maybe around timing, right? So you're saying that if we diagnose right now in October and six months goes by before the initiation of treatment, that, could, that diagnosis might be invalid where the insurance company looks at a diagnosis and the date of diagnosis and determines like it's too old and it will consider it invalid. To me, it's really shocking to hear the six months caveat because we all, know, I mean, I'm just speaking from my experience here in South Carolina, it's a long wait. I mean, it's a long wait for ABA services. I'm sure it's six months in many cases. And, and so it's almost, they are gonna be outdated then if that's, gonna, if that's one of the criteria. And then this third point that you're making is that if there are comorbid diagnoses that we list in the report, that that may be used to deny, used by insurance companies to deny medically necessary services for autism. Yeah. Cause they're, cause we're targeting an ABA and it's often because of mandates specific to autism. So the, what can happen from time to time is the comorbidity is being used to say, Hey, that comorbid condition is what should be targeted, not autism. Right. You know, so it's, or that comorbid condition is interfering with the ability to make progress in ABA related to autism. So that's where we definitely see comorbidity uh, showing up in, in the determinations that are being made. And I do kind of speak into your point about, you know, the studies out of Japan and the comorbidity and how if we don't know a child has, you know, a person has autism and we're treating mental health concerns, that could undermine the eff efficacy. And to, I'm going to speak just for me, the psychologist, it's kind of the same perspective of we're trying to provide a, a you know, comprehensive clinical picture and feel that if you don't know this child also has these other characteristics, it may be challenging to treat, you know, plan, tr plan and execute treatment to the, you know, in the best way possible. And that's kind of our perspective coming to it. Meaning I am going to speak for myself in my perspective. I just assumed again, make the assumption of if I have other co-occurring diagnoses like ADHD, 
it's like this child has more impairment and needs serve like even more of a reason to provide services. And so it's so interesting mm -hmm. to me to hear that that's actually not happening and the opposite is happening. And it's shocking and very important for us to be aware of because that's, I don't think that's our intention at all. One that we see pretty common is IQ, um, you know, kind of reference. And I don't know, would you, would you typically think of IQ as like a comorbid if there was like a low IQ or, you know, would you see that as a comorbid or how would you think about that as a psychologist? Well, so from a DSM perspective, not that that's a psychologist perspective, the diagnosis is listed as having autism spectrum disorder with intellectual impairment. And so it's a co-occurring you know, set of characteristics that is like from our perspective, important in informing treatment. It sounds like the insurance companies use it to, to not use it as a rationale for they're not gonna to respond to treatment. Now they may, they may have a slower response to treatment depending on you know, the level of their intellectual disability, but that doesn't necessarily mean that we shouldn't provide treatment. And you would see intellectual impairment kind of being one factor that would probably lead to being, because exactly like you're saying, I, I would hope that would be the interpretation is like, yeah, this is the level of intellectual impairment is going to require more intervention, more supports, more likely a longer uh, time of therapy. You know, it's, you know, there's, there's just going to be a lot of, uh, but not that it's like, somebody's intellectual impairment is so low that they would not benefit from therapy. You know, could you see an example where somebody has confirmed diagnosis of autism, you know, they you know, are struggling with social, social communication, highly repetitive behavior, and then they, but their intellectual impairment is so low that they should not access therapy. I can't think of a situation. I know that there's that argument out there. To me, there's always adaptive behaviors and skills that you can teach. And to me, we can only answer that question after a course of treatment. Sure. You know, yes, we, when we do our diagnostic assessments, we gather information related to level of impairment related to cognitive, you know, disability, but how they might respond to treatment that is designed for them, meeting them where they're at, what skills they could learn is yet to be determined. Yes, we could maybe make some, you know, some conclusions that, they're not going to drive or they you know they may have you know difficulties accessing the community living independently but we never usually even say like they're not going to be able to live independently we say meet them where they're at see how far we can take them in terms of treatment education and that's how we determine it to mean a diagnostic profile is not going should be the conclusion it should just start the conversation and that was an excellent point too about how you you can't you know kind of a priori determine that you need to have <clears throat> the treatment data and the experience and we've talked about that too. I mean the goal should be absolutely as high as possible, completely fully functional, etc. And then over time you kind of adjust and see where the issues are and see what would be the maximum um, areas to really focus on. But that's something that's informed by the treatment. It doesn't, and it should never be a basis to just, you know, at the outset deny treatment. Mm -hmm. Is what I'm hearing. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I mean, I just think in conclusion, like for psychologists listening to this, just for them to be aware that that can complicate access to treatment, and for us to be careful in our language about how we're describe. You know, maybe there are ways we can clarify that this should not deter, you know, deter or detract from the need for ABA. I do think the important takeaway is that somehow it is communicated that because of the autism and to address the impairing conditions resulting from the autism, this child needs intensive ABA treatment. Now it's undermined the ability to say, oh, because of this other you know, feature that we can somehow cut back on that. No, the child, because of the autism, even with this other dimension, requires intensive ABA to address that and may, may need other types of treatment to address other conditions, uh, but they need that at a minimum. You know, kind of the uh, um, autism plus is also treatment plus, you know, it's ABA plus. Um, this, I, I think we're nearing the end of our time. I don't want to cut this short, but this kind of, I, I hope shows whoever's listening 
this is how these conversations can go is and this is how they are uh, going amongst us right now and we wanted to kind of open that up and share with you uh, to really engage with you and um, to uh, try and improve the system, improve the transparency, improve the knowledge of how diagnostic reports are being used, how we can do them better, how we can also perhaps supplement those diagnostic reports with other education, training, uh, white papers, et cetera, to make sure, which is everybody's goal, that um, by diagnosing kids, you not only are giving them a label, but you're also giving them a path to, to treatment and all the treatment that they need and make sure that happens. And so uh, we would love to hear from you to, to kind of engage with us in this process. Um, I believe we'll have uh, contact information uh, so you can contact us and, and give us your contact information so we can keep you involved. Uh, we'd love to hear your ideas uh, about um, some of the things we've been talking about and proposals and thoughts about how we can improve the system. Um, but that's really been our goal um, from, the, from the start when we just started to have these conversations. Um, you know, Tim, Kim, if you want to kind of weigh in from your perspective on this, uh, that would be fabulous. Sure, I'm happy to. Um, it's to me, it's like to increase awareness of like what happens after, right? After they leave with the diagnostic report for to raise awareness and collaboration around that process and to kind of problem solve around in ensuring that our diagnostic reports are designed in a way that communicates appropriately to the person receiving it, whether it be the insurance company, whether it be a BCBA, it's like almost like, did you know what happens after they leave your office and what the barriers they may face and how can we as diagnosticians decrease those barriers? Yeah, that's what I was most excited is that you know, just to hear, you know, the, you know, from you, Kim, like this, you know, this really the goal is to access treatment and the kind of the shock to hear about like some of the things that are happening and ways things are being interpreted and, you know, find, you know, really good strategies for how BCBAs when, when they're really being tasked with interpreting and a, a report and having to make a decision, like, is this appropriate or not appropriate, which is way outside of our scope. And, uh, what we should be asked to do and so knowing that how could we, we potentially could connect back with the uh, diagnostician and so you know i'm hoping maybe we can have a couple of other conversations like this so that we could explore some of these other topics and you know can kind of dive in some to some of these other you know really core areas around uh, diagnosis but you know this is um, i think our first foray into getting some information out we'd love to find some other strategies like we, we referenced dan and we'll Kind of keep keep the conversation going and keep getting information out that this is this is really 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 an important area to address, um, so that we can make sure individuals with autism can access treatment. All right, well, thank you guys so much, um, and uh, please do um, give us your info and stay in touch with us, and we we look forward to speaking with you again. Yes.